Two nights ago, my wife found me sitting in front of the computer staring at the screen, a blank screen with a blank look on my face. And being a loving helpmate, she asked me what the problem was. And I said, well, I have to introduce Bill Coleman in two days, and I don't know what to say. And as Dean Small has indicated, I've written an article on Mr. Coleman. And so my wife, knowing that, said, what do you mean you don't know what to say? <laughs> you wrote an article on the man. And I said, well, I can present facts, but I don't know how to properly pay tribute to the remarkable legal career that Mr. Coleman has enjoyed. I mean, here's a man who clerked for Felix Frankfurter. Here's a man who was in the courtroom when Thurgood Marshall argued Brown 1 and Brown 2 would help write the briefs. This is a gentleman who uh, himself headed up the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who was Secretary of Transportation, advisor to six presidents, who has moved effortlessly back and forth between the private and the public practice of law. A man who spent an hour and a half with Brezhnev in the former Soviet Union talking about Alexander Pushkin. And my wife said, well, what do you want to boil your message down to? And I said, I want to boil my message down to for the law students in the room. I want them to look to Mr. Coleman and say, this is the type of lawyer you should be someday. The type of lawyer who uses your legal skills not only to defend your clients, the Ford Motor Companies of the world, but also you use your legal skills to affect powerful social change. And my wife said, well, why don't you just say that? And I've just said it. <laughs> so for law, for law students in the room, this should be your role model. And with further ado, I present to you Bill Coleman. say how can an active person in the civil rights movement 
really think he was a great man. But I think he was great because when the Civil War broke out, he was leading the troops, and, and uh, uh, Lincoln asked him to lead the Northern troops. <coughs> he refused, saying, I think my commitment is with the South. Now, can you imagine that but for that integrity, what would have happened? So I really think that uh, Robert E. Lee deserves the same uh, uh, appreciation as George Washington. Certainly after he left and coming to this university, what he did, he certainly should rank, and you should teach him as being one of the great Americans in American history. As, I, as you all know, life is always full of a lot of difficulties and surprises. And this group among the young, you really fa face many challenges. First, one of the most fascinating things is today the Middle East. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the Middle East. The Middle East is very active. Uh, one of the great ironies of both history and current event is that the Middle East should be the source of so much trouble for those who live there, for the United States, and for the rest of the world today. After all, consider to what degree that region, with a long life, has enriched, ennobled, and shaped humanity over many years. It is the birth tapes of three great religions, and in a very sense, it's the birthplace of civilization itself. A professor at the University of California has substituted, should have substituted the phrase Middle Eastern for Asian in the following passage from his masterly 2008 book, Worlds at War. Quote, an adopted Asian woman gave Europe its name. A vagrant Asian exile gave Europe its political and finally its cultural identity. And an Asian prophet gave Europe its religion. The lady in question, as I'm pretty sure everybody knows, was named Europa. She was Phoenician from today's Lebanon. Uh, Another gentleman was from today's Turkey, and Jesus Christ, as you know, was born in the Middle East uh, at a time uh, when that part of the world was a fascinating part, and today, as you know, is occupied by Israel. Yet, in the 60 years plus since World War II, the very word Middle East has been virtually synonymous with bad news. Whatever their vast differences, the residents have suffered in common. They have waged at least a dozen wars. About half of those conflicts have put, uh, uh, pitted Arabs against Israelis, but the rest have been among Arabs as between Arabs, Kurds, Persians, and, Af and Africans. American Europeans and a host of others. I raise this not to bore you, but to point out that this is the type of situation you as lawyers have to be known today. Recently there were two cases where women, Muslim women, went to school in the United States and because they wore the hat wraps, the other students attacked them. Both withdrew and both got a settlement of over two million apiece. I beg you to understand that part of the world. You've got to realize that that part of the world was formed long before the United States became great. Uh, my mother and father often taught me, please reread that book by Gibbon on the rise of the Roman Empire, because that empire also fell. And therefore, you have to recognize that if you're going to discharge your responsibility as American citizens, you have to meet these uh, uh, challenges. The second challenge, and I guess I don't have to say it to this school, but I would, 
is revealed in chapter 8 of Alan Greenspan's book, where he says that the great success of the United States is that each year we've been able to increase productivity by 6%. But try as you might, the scholar, the Phi Beta Kappa graduate, and others can only give you 3% of that. The other 3% comes because you have people well-trained, working in the workforce, who discover the differences. Just go back and ask some of these automobile companies that what they did and the plans they had, but somebody on the line said you can't do that. And that's one of the reasons why you really have to begin to train the generation of the young. The third is I suggest to you, because I recall a son of great marriage in Massachusetts. His name was W.E. Du Bois, who earned in 1895 Harvard's PhD in, in political and social science. But he soon recognized that whatever you've been doing in this world, we had success only if in each generation they developed a talented tenth. That tenth who's led us, whether it's George Washington, Robert E. Lee, or Jefferson, is the difference between what makes this country a great country and a mediocre one. And therefore, you have a commitment to work very hard in this school and begin to make changes. Obviously, if you look at the whole question of the civil rights movement, the reason why it was successful in my judgment, at least, was there were two people, one Charles Houston, who went to Amherst, got a Phi Beta Kappa key, then went to the Harvard Law School, and he made the Harvard Law Review. The other one was his first cousin, William H. Hasty, who also went to Amherst, and went to Harvard Law School, and he too was on the Harvard Law Review. Both of them were taught by Frankfurter Frankfurter recognized their sheer ability. Bill Hasty ended up as a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, and Charlie Houston ended up as dean of the Howard Law School, and both Bill Hasty and Charlie Houston taught Thurgood Marshall. I really think that those two people made the difference as to what you had before and what you had today. That doesn't mean that there weren't other great people to help them. I think Paul Freund, for example, knew, knew Bill Hasty because he was also in the Harvard Law Review. And the Harvard Law Review at that time said they had a dinner for all the uh, editors, but they weren't going to invite Bill Hasty because of his color. At that point, Paul Freund induced all of the third year students on the Law Review to boycott the meeting, so therefore they changed, and Bill Hasty went to that meeting. I just urge you sometime to read, or I guess you've been here two years already, to reread some of his opinions, and you will find them. When you look at the civil rights movement and the uh, whole question of, uh, of how after the Dred Scott decision and Plessy versus Ferguson, that lawyers well-trained could decide to make a difference, but you have to look at, in part, the procedure. You have to recognize that the first uh, cases dealing with education, that Charlie Houston and Bill Hasty had the vision and the courage to say, why don't we attack the law schools? Why don't we attack Missouri Law School, which actually had a statute which said if you were black, you couldn't go to Missouri, but you go to any other law school in the country. And, and it's kind of hard for both Hasty and uh, Houston to stand up there and say Missouri was better than Harvard, but they used the skill by saying, do you realize that so many of the lawyers, that some of them become judges, and can't you see the benefit if you're going to law school with the guy who often becomes a judge? And that case, they won. They then had after that, the advantage of uh, 
John W. Davis, and I beg you, even though he was on the other side of the brown cake, don't think ill of him. Because in 1950, Davis, when Solicitor General of the United States, argued a case which declared unconstitutional a state statute which says you couldn't vote unless you could prove that your father or grandfather had voted someplace in the world. And therefore, just about every black, uh, you didn't vote in Africa, you didn't vote there, they couldn't vote. But he argued that case and he won it 7 to 2. Uh, not only that, uh, in the Brown case, and other than the Ford Foundation, uh, Mr. Davis's daughter gave more money to the Legal Defense Fund than anybody else. And third, when Thurgood Marshall won the case, the first telephone call he got was for John W. Davis, who said, I'm pretty sure you will handle this in the proper way. And so we got to look at history the same way I talked about Lee. There are people that have had a part to play in history, and there may be one thing to disagree with, but the main thing is, do the domain have the beat of the American people? Do they have what those, do they have what Hamilton had, who had the judgment that you have to build a system of transportation? Do they had what uh, a gentleman named uh, uh, Carver had after being uh, educated at University of Indiana, decided to go back south. He taught your, your grandfather, you southerners, that the foolish thing is you can grow cotton only three times and then you got the rest of the land for two years. As a result of that, you grew other crops. And for 35 years, I think, if you do the study again today, many of you would say that Carver did more to save the south and permitted what it is today than almost anybody else. The very talented person. You also have to recognize that there were men of color who were very talented. And for example, very few people know or say, or at least I was not taught, that the Battle of Gettysburg, that 20% of those troops were black. And they fought, and unfortunately for you Southerners, they turned back and that had a lot to do with winning the war. Also, there was a gentleman many years ago in, a, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that uh, taught Dr. Mather uh, how to give a certain type of medical procedure, which led to the ability to get rid of a lot of diseases. And finally, there's another gentleman who in 1940, just before the war started, who developed the concept of blood plasma. And everyone that has in the room that has a father who hit that beach on Normandy and got shot and had a lot of blood, he, he lived only because of this technique on how to have blood plasma. And you could really go down the line and indicate uh, there's so many that have that. And, and, and they're just waiting for the opportunity. But the fact is, in this country today, we've done a lot of great things. And we've permitted a lot of freedom. We've really gotten to the point where the papers say that 30 years from now, the, the whites will be in the minority, that between the blacks, the Spanish-speaking American, other people. What I really think that your mission is to continue to operate the way you did, Pick the people that you ought to train and bring them together. If you do, this nation will remain a great nation. If you don't, we'll end up like the Roman Empire. And I just beg you to reach out and remember, but I, I wish more teachers would uh, spend more time talking about people of color throughout the world who are very successful. That like I knew about the Queen of Sheba long before I knew about the first Queen of England. And my mother and father taught me that. I knew the Dumas, Dumas brothers in France were great writers. I knew about Pushkin. I knew about Pushkin uh, uh, grandparents who came over, married a Russian nobleman, and after that uh, uh, Peter the Great liked him so well that he made him a Russian nobleman. He then made him a major general, 
sent him to Europe for five years to learn how to use artillery fire. He comes back in the Battle of Potomac in 1707. He led the Russians, and the first time ever, they defeated a European power. Now, obviously, that man is well respected in Russia. I'm pretty sure that uh, in this room, if I were a gambling man, bet you, probably less than 10% of you know that Pushkin was black and would know the history of what happened. And you'll find that all over the world. I mean, you know, when, when, when the Romans came into Great Britain before it found, some of those troops were black troops. And not only that, when they went back to Rome, they became citizens just like everybody else. So that's our great challenge. Uh, the, the, the schools have to do it. Uh, getting back to the civil rights case, I would beg all of you to read a book by Mr. Norton on President Eisenhower and the Civil Rights Movement, published just year, last year. I got to know uh, President Eisenhower uh, very well. Well, I got to know him, at least when he saw me in the room, he recognized who it was. So <laughs> uh, and uh, after uh, he left the office, I often visited him up in Gettysburg. And one day we had this wonderful lunch, and he said, you know, I'd like to tell you how I felt about people of color. He said, of course, I was born in Texas, segregated. I then came to Kansas, uh, very few blacks, although there was one black on the other team. And my football players, my team said, we can't play them. But Eisenhower said that I'll change my position and I'll play against him and that's how they played the ball game. But he said he then goes to West Point, completely segregated. He then gets trained to, sent to the South to learn how to be a fighting man. He said, three things changed my mind. One was the 332nd Fighter Group, which uh, was part of the Tuskegee Airmen, that they, one of their missions were to develop uh, 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 how to protect bombers, and the whole time they escorted the bomber fight over Germany, and they never lost a bomber. In addition, there's a guy named Roscoe Brown, near the end of the war when the Germans, believe it or not, had jet airplanes before we had them. And he, in a P-51, got jumped by a German jet, and he figured out how to defeat it. Very simple. And that was, he knew the jet went much faster than he did, so when the jet got on his tail, all you do is pull back and go slow, and he shoots past you before he can shoot, then you can knock the guy down. Believe it or not, for a year and a half, that's what the U U.S. Air Force used to drop people down. He said, the second thing was, at the about, this is Eisenhower, at the Battle of the Bulge, I recognized that for four days, the black troops held that line, because it took in four days to get there. And he said that made me feel a difference. And based upon that, I then changed. Uh, uh, you talk a lot about the Brown case, and uh, uh, you ought to recognize that after the second argument, when the court finally said the school segregation was illegal and set it down for the decree, which will be argued about eight months later, Eisenhower at that point decided that uh, uh, he should desegregate the schools in Washington, D.C., which he did. He also decided that he should desegregate every institution in the Army. And he finally said, I feel my responsibility is to desegregate every institution which is controlled by the federal government. That something controlled by the state, uh, I don't think I can get into it until the federal court decides to to make the order, then I can come in the way he did in Little Rock. Uh, also, you have uh, the fact that clearly, as the Attorney General told Eisenhower, and Sister General told him, the big fight is going to be really exerted in the states, in the federal courts, in the district courts, in the Court of Appeals. And I just ask you to go back and look at the people he appointed to those 
And those are the things that made the difference. I say this because I hope all of you would say the country today really ought to rejoice in victory. I mean, try as we may, I never thought in 2008 we're going to elect a black person president of the United States. We've done it. Uh, but the opportunity is to help him. I'm a Republican. I'm four years from now, maybe I'm campaigning, saying let's vote for somebody else. But right now, uh, you, to help him to really make this country what it has to be. The emphasis on schools, it, no doubt about it, that, that the teachers today, I hope there's none in this room, uh, are not, not teaching. I mean, a number of teachers, when I was a young lawyer in Philadelphia, I'd go in to make a speech or something, and eighth grade, I'd sit in a room, and you're supposed to know algebra by then, and they can't teach a kid algebra. Uh, and why? It's very simple. Uh, when I came along to go to school, the only thing a lady of real talent and ability to do is teach. Now they go into law firms, they go into banking firms, they go every place, and so you have to work at it and get other people. I think it's so important that you do that. Uh, it's so important that you recognize that, uh, and this is both black and white, and my kids went to the Yale Law School then, when they went, my daughter about a year and a half apart, uh, uh, that when they had their lunch, they all ate together, oh, black, only about 10 there, they all ate together. The only white person who ever sit at that table was Bill Clinton. And that was in part because Bill Clinton, a year ago, the first year at law school, had roomed with my son, and I paid to feed both of them. So, look what it did to it. And, and I just that way, and, and I just wish you'd spend some time just saying, you know, people of color, just what talent do they have? You know, the other day there was a celebration in Washington, and Colin Powell was there, and they had people, a lady dressed in the same dress that that great singer from Philadelphia uh, gave at, at the monument when she couldn't sing uh, at the DAR recreation. And you know, she had a lot of talent, and you just go down the list, you'll see that. But that doesn't mean there aren't some dumb people. <laughs> you know, and you've got to recognize that. And, but even important, you've got to recognize that there are some people that have great bitterness and they just don't like the way they were treated for the last 50 or 100 years. But you've got to understand that. And I'd say the same way with respect to Muslims. You know, they, that, that, that's a great, great religion. Uh, I, I'm embarrassed, but uh, I was in Algeria uh, one time <coughs> and trying to uh, get them to sell natural gas because you could freeze it now. Uh, 600 to 1, and to burn off, take the ship across the Atlantic, and you could do it. I was not successful, and I really think I was not successful because I flunked in one test. I didn't realize that the Algerians in 550 had uh, developed algebra, and they also developed how you use zero in an equation. And I really think when I was sitting in that crucial meeting, if I had known that, and then also made a dumb statement about a month ago, I said, you mean to tell me the Muslims really thought of that before the Christians? And I said, wait a minute, Coleman, the Muslims didn't start existing until six, well, 615, didn't it? And so therefore, this was done in 550. And I really, no, you really got to understand this part of our, now I'm about ready to conclude, but, you know, some of the world has changed, and I I've got this from Brooks Brothers. Uh, I don't think that 10 years ago you would see an ad like that and you see that at least two of them are black. And if you look at the newspapers today or the television, it's amazing the extent to which you see on television that everybody's there. Uh, I also would urge you to read uh, this book called St. John Glory Rule where there are five or six law clerks who worked on Brown and they all indicate uh, what they did and why they did it. 
and it's a very fascinating book. Uh, there's a reference to me, and I'm sorry that it's in there because it said that I was the only one in the room to say instead of trying to get a fourth fifth decree, you should go for a graduate uh, uh, decree. Uh, but uh, that's what they turned out, and I'll leave it to history whether that made sense or not. Uh, finally, there's a wonderful book, which I haven't read all, by a guy named Lawrence Tribe called The Invisible Constitution. And I wish you'd read it, and I also have with me a copy of the Constitution, and uh, you got to realize this great document is only about uh, 20 or 21 page, but you take, well now they decide what, 90 cases a year or 70, one time 200 cases, and all of that somehow is 20 pages, and obviously they do a lot of things where you say, well why did they do that, but they work it out. But it's a document that you ought to be proud of, and you ought to understand it, uh, and your children should understand it. You know, uh, we, when we came over, when we came over here, and what also about how minorities came. You know, there's a wonderful story. Well, on a certain day in Virginia, uh, uh, certain slaves came over, and then what happened to them? Well, it turned out that the document says that of those slaves that came over, ten of them were indentured servants. <coughs> Under the law of indentured servants, after seven years, they had to give you freedom. And they did give freedom, and you have to realize that there were blacks in the South <coughs> who owned plantations, and they had slaves. And so this idea that it was all one side just wasn't so. And I probably bore you, but I really want to urge you to meet the challenges. Oh, you've gotten to this point in this great world. <coughs> I think you are the great world. I think that when you look at what we did in World War Number One, World War Number Two, and what we did against the Japanese, and what we have, we certainly have earned the respect. But the Chinese, I just read the other day, after that meeting of twenty, that almost everybody there said, you know, now there are only two great powers in this world: one's the United States, and the other the Chinese, and therefore you have to. Learn it. I mean, our law firm, we have 125 lawyers in China, and believe me, a lot of them are good, and they're learning things, and they really want to make a difference, but I think we have the ability when we can. I could go on, but I'd like to end by giving you two remarks, each of which was given to me and Elliot Richardson the last day we were working for Justice Frankfurter. The first is the mere fact that wisdom seldom, if ever, comes is no longer, and there's no reason to reject it, really because it comes late. And it's amazing what you learn by the keep at it. And the second one was, and this is to all the lawyers. <coughs> the greatest talent of a good lawyer is to know how quickly to become expert in what's relevant. And if you can do those two things, plus read all the cases, uh, I think you'll have great careers. I appreciate very much being here. And I end as a start to come to a place named after George Washington and Robert E. Lee. To me, is a real privilege. Thank you. Mr. Coleman is willing to take some questions. I just ask if you'd speak up a bit, but he is willing to take any questions you may have on a, a wide variety of topics related to his career. I'd like to start with the fact that I think I'm pretty good at answer. <laughs> <laughs> when I argued the Bob Jones case, and that was a case in the university which took blacks but segregated them, and therefore the government below had said they were not entitled to their tax exemption. Uh, but by the time they got to the Supreme Court, the government changed its position and said they were. So the Supreme Court asked me to come in and make it. I make a pretty argument, or re-argument, 
Mr. Justice Powell, who I think went here today, leaned over and said, Mr. Coleman, if you win this case, does that mean that women's colleges can't get the tax exemption because they don't take men? I knew his wife was on the board of trustees of Smith. <laughs> so I looked at him a minute and I said, Mr. Justice, you have to realize we fought a war over race. We haven't fought one over sex. That's how I, I got away with it. <laughs> okay. Come on, you, you people back here, you're paying for the whole thing, right? <laughs> well, I've got my money's worth. <laughs> well, this, you, if you gave money to this institution, which you did, you certainly made a good investment. I've been tremendously impressed here. And even though I have some grandchildren, I always thought they should go to Harvard or Yale or Penn, I may think trying to get some of them in school could be really <laughs> impressive. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Some have written that there's been an overemphasis on the court's role in the civil rights revolution and that really other things like the street protests were more important. What is your sense of how those, the legal, court work and the work in the yeah. organizing connected or clashed? Well, I, you know, if you look at it from yourself, uh, and I thought that at the time we started, there were six cases which held that separate but equal was constitutional. There were also law review articles by real scholars who said there's nothing to the 14th and 15th Amendment which says you can't have segregation. Uh, in addition, I've always felt that if you're in the room where the decisions are made, you're better off than you're walking on the street. I've never been, you know, and I'm certainly Martin Luther King did what he did, that's fine. Uh, though, to tell you the truth, and because Kennedy got all the credit, when Martin Luther King got arrested, I was the one who got him out of jail because uh, Phil Elman, who had been a Frankfurt lawyer, called me up and said, you realize the statute which he's charged with doesn't call for a jail penalty. So how can you hold the guy in jail until you have the hearing? Uh, and I, he said, I've been trying to call Nixon all day to tell him this because he's camping and can't tell you. So I told Thurgood Marsh, we showed it to the judge, and that stuff got out. Four, four hours later, Kennedy gets and starts it, but it's all right, But because uh, I wasn't running for president. <laughs> and, 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 and I really, I mean, I, I'm not here to talk about I, but uh, uh, it's amazing what you can do if you're in the room. When I was at the Doerr firm, for example, in Philadelphia, we represented Bill Levitt. Bill Levitt would not sell to blacks in New Jersey, in, in, in New York, and he was opening a facility in Pennsylvania, and he wasn't going to sell the blacks. Uh, I was doing legal work for him, not on that, but on the question of one, he bought these 15,000 acres of land, and he just assumed that the water power, which was still owned by the owner on the next week, that he had the right to that. But the owner said, no, you don't. I didn't sell you that. Now, can you imagine having 15,000 acres of land trying to sell them to the public and don't have any water? So I brought a lawsuit and proved that it was a public utility. And there's several other things. But at then the Liberty Defense Fund sued them because they were segregated. And unfortunately, they relied only upon the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment applies only to the states. So the Dilworth firm, I didn't represent the Dilworth firm, but uh, they. Uh, I, I didn't represent him this, but other people in the firm represented him, and he won in the district. And I told him, you're probably going to win in the circuit, but I really think you would look at it. So finally he said, why don't you call Thurgood Marshall over? And we spent three days, and after that he said, I'll agree to sell in Pennsylvania to everybody to do that in New York and New Jersey, and the only thing in Pennsylvania I want to be able to make the first hundred sales without doing that. So that's right. He called me two weeks later. Why did he call me two weeks later? Anybody know? So he called me two weeks later. He said, Coleman, you're a genius. 
Because what did Johnson do? He appointed Weaver as Secretary of HUD, who's the first black, well actually he was the second black. You know who the first one was? Alexander Hamilton. But nobody knows that, but go read the history books. He was the first. But, but he called him and, and he said, can you imagine my life, because I get 90% of my money for the government, if I hadn't done what you said. And so that's the way it happened. And that doesn't mean the pickets don't work or, uh, uh, you know, uh, when the Gerard case, Gerard College case came up, uh, uh, Cecil Moore said he's going to pick it and everything, but he finally said he's going to pick it in front of my house because I, you know, was going to try to bring the lawsuit. And uh, uh, I said, well, you pick it in front of me, but I'd like to tell you that I live on a hill. <laughs> And you go out of trouble. So he did he pick it downtown one day. And then, 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 then you know, we won the case. Now something's happened in that case which disturbed me very much. The other day I got a memo saying, and you know, the Gerard rule was for white orphans, male only. Well, and we were trying to get blacks, in part because it's in North Philadelphia, the ghetto, and we also felt it was proper. But now, believe it or not, that 96% of the students do our culture black. And I just think that's wrong. And I just think that somebody should be able to work it out so it could be that way. But that's that's a fact of life. And that's one thing that I gotta urge you to do. Like there's another case, oh, which is coming up in the Supreme Court next week, where where uh, New Haven, Connecticut felt that it ought to increase its lieutenants in the firemen's force. So they gave, they said, we're going to create 10 new spots. And they gave an exam to everybody, and something like 22 people took the exam. Well, the first 12 people that the higher marks were the whites. Uh, so the blacks said, you know, well, you still have to take some of us, but they didn't do it. So they abandoned the whole program. Uh, but I really think that uh, there ought to be some way that you work that out. I do think that if you can't pass the exam, I think, you know, I don't think a white person should say you shouldn't get the job. But that's what it's all about. And you, you just got to get there and trade. And you do, you know, the labor, you, you trade. You know, the Ford Motor Company knows how to trade on labor negotiation. GM apparently doesn't. So <laughs> GM has to go through bankruptcy, but, but Ford is in the work. And that's really, I just beg you, you young people have to learn those skills. It's amazing if you know that, what you can do for your client, but what you can do for your country. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you want to, you're thoughtful. You give me a, a D plus for this talk or what? Well, no, I would, uh, What? Uh, at least an A minus. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on how you answer it this way. <laughs> Given that Brown, um, while it generally succeeded, it didn't succeed in integrating schools. Uh, at least in, in most parts of the country, and at least in, for the first couple of decades. Uh, I was thinking about the comment you made that you had advocated a more restrained uh, request for remedies. I, I wonder if you think perhaps the NAACP abandoned the equalization campaign too early. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, from what I know, they didn't, but, uh, you know, no doubt about it. You know, I went to public schools. My first son went to first grade in public school. It was lousy. So I sent him to Germantown Friends. I went to Germantown Friends. And at that time, it didn't cost it much now. So from doing that, they got into, uh, they got into uh, Williams College. They didn't know about this college. Maybe try it. <laughs> they got into Williams College. And then the two older ones became lawyers. They both went to Yale Law School. And the younger one came home and said, I know you want to be a lawyer, but do you realize if I become a lawyer, for the rest of your life, the Coleman family will be known as Father Dominic. So I want to teach. So he uh, taught in some prep schools in Philadelphia, married a wonderful girl, and called me one day and said, well, by the way, I've just been hired to teach at the University of Shanghai. So he goes out to the University of Shanghai and teaches for two years. They calls me one day and said, I just got accepted to get a PhD at uh, Stanford. I assume you'll pay for it. <laughs> and he did pay for it. He came, and the day he graduated, uh, Donna Shalila hired him at the University of Wisconsin because she was president then. 
and he'd been there until uh, he became a full professor there until uh, the first of June, and he decided to take the deanship at the at Boston University, which uh, is fine. So he's there now. And, you know, that, but that, that's happening. You know, just pick out your American Express. Do you realize a guy who's chief executive there is black? And just you know, you really go down and take Etner Life Insurance Company, <laughs> and that's happening. And and that's something that every American should be proud of. The question is, how do we make it happen more, but yet avoid the fights that you you know you shouldn't have, uh, because people say, well, you don't have that many people of color there, or don't have Hispanic background. I just think you've got to work those out. That's the challenge of this generation. That that how you do it. And I think uh, you've got to take a look at the 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 army. I think the army has you know the military has worked out problems better than anybody else. If you go abroad to Europe and those schools they have for the children, those schools are as integrated as any place you've ever seen. And that's the way it should be. And that doesn't mean that's the only thing you should pay attention to. But I think that for the next five or six years, we all should, both sides, should pay a lot of attention. I'd be able to call each other on the phone, talk to each other, and say, well, do this, but if you do this, you realize you're causing this problem. I just think it's got to be worked out. And, and you've worked out other tremendous problems, uh, and this is one that everybody in this room is challenged to work out. I want to thank you very much for coming here today. Let's give Mr. Coleman one more time. say that. So one day the Chinese got so angry, they pick up an iron and he threw it. My father picked it up, threw it back at him. Fortunately it didn't hit him, but it broke the window. My grandmother says that every at that point, every policeman in Baltimore was looking for my father. Fortunately my grandmother knew the owner of the Afro-American, which was the Murphy's very big paper, and fortunately, he knew the president of Hampton. So he called him, and my, 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 uh, my uh, grandmother said, well, to Murphy, well, you got to give me the president's phone number. I know you don't realize his house to dinner with me. So, uh, and he calls him and says, I think you should take my son in to Hampton. And the guy said, yes, I know you very well, Bessie. Honestly, he shows up, and he's only 14, <laughs> that great, so he certainly can't go to college. But fortunately, Hampton at that time had a trade school. And uh, so he went to trade school. He really still had some furniture that he made during the time. Then he went to Hampton, finished. He taught a year in Virginia at $75 a month. And when he asked for a raise, the white superintendent says, I can't give you a raise, but from here on out, I'll call you professor. He then, so instead, he went to Philadelphia in the Quaker Civil Boys Club. And, People like uh, uh, Murphy, uh, Cunningham, all people went there, and they also had a summer camp. And my father had two expressions, and I never understood why these were so important to him until I heard the background of the story. He always would say, there's no such thing as a bad boy, there's just a good boy caught doing something wrong. Uh, <coughs> thereafter, the other statement was, a boy is a diamond in the rough, and character, and you have a jewel. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was out at, you know, that's story one. Story two is, I was out at uh, Dean Edson's place because I was on something called the Civil, Civil Committee for Procedure, and Dean Edson was president of it, and the Chief Justice was there, and we started talking about different things, and Edson finally said, well, I want to tell you, you know, he was the son of a Bishop Minister and everything. I want to tell you, he said, when I went to Harvard 
in law school, uh, I room with a guy, and something was done in that room where the dean of Harvard said, whoever did going to kick out, no answer the but. And so Cole Porter, who was there, came to us and said, I'll take the blame because I never want to be a lawyer anyway. I wanted to go to uh, New York and be a theater. So that's how Dean Ashton got to stay. He went on to become the great Secretary of State and Cole Porter. And I really, I mean, you really you read history about people, you know, I've, and, and it's amazing the extent to which it's sometime in your life you did something, it's just not right, and you have that kind person to kind of direct you, and those why, that's part of your challenge. Thank you.